Hello everyone and welcome back. Thank you for still being here. Um, it's been a while. I realize that. Uh, lots of things have been happening. I finally finished with exams that I've been reviewing for for the last five months or so. Things have only been getting worse in this country, I think. The pandemic has been getting worse. People I know personally either testing positive or having people in their lives who are testing positive. The government response to the pandemic has been getting worse. The government response to people trying to do their own thing to help each other has been getting worse. Um, if you've been following the news about all the community pantries that have been cropping up throughout Metro Manila or even beyond, you'll know that there's been there's been a lot of resistance towards towards these pantries for no good reason. Things have been difficult. It's been hard to get back to this uh, vlog thing. In the face of all of these things just getting harder and harder, I guess just allow me to be frivolous for the next 20 or so minutes as we talk about movies and TV. I will be leaving the usual links down below. I'm also going to try and look for the map that shows all of the different community pantries that you can either donate to in cash or in goods um, or that you can support in, in any way you can. Now in this video we're going to be going way back because I haven't made one of these in a very long time so I'm going to be talking about things that I saw all the way back in February. The thing to be more excited about is hopefully Tomorrow, from the time I'm recording this, I'll be able to do a video ranking the eight Best Picture nominees for this year in time for the Oscars that are going to be on Monday morning Philippine time. So look out for that. Hopefully I get it, I get it done. But first things first, let's talk about TV. There are a couple of shows that I finished watching in February. The first one uh, being The Expanse Season 5, which picks up quite a bit of time where Season 4 left off. Now the ring worlds are all open for people to explore. However, the crew of the Rocinante and all their allies have to deal with the emergence of Marco Inaros, the Belter terrorist who wants to claim uh, the right to explore these worlds himself and for the Belters, and he wants to do that by eradicating, essentially, life on Earth. Now, I have quite a lot to say about the portrayal of Marco Inaros. I don't actually think the show is very fair to him and his ideology, um, and that's a whole different can of worms. But for the most part, I still do love how The Expanse is just such a sophisticated science fiction show. Um, they obviously have even more of a budget now than, than last season, but what I love is that the show just keeps getting smaller in the stories it's telling. Uh, it, it just keeps becoming more intimate, so it doesn't actually feel like they're using the budget and all the CG to show off. It really just feels like they're trying to immerse us even more into this sci-fi world. And I'm, I actually wasn't really a fan of the first few seasons of The Expanse because I wasn't attached to the characters. So it really makes me happy to see that even later on in their lifespan, the show is deepening its characters more than ever before. And Dominique Tipper, who plays Naomi Nagata in this, in this show, is like the reason to watch it this season. Um, her little subplot with Marco Inaros is the meat and the heart of the entire thing. Um, and she has these scenes and these episodes where she's just completely alone trying to solve one of those uh, trademark physics-driven expanse problems and she completely sells the desperation of her situation. She is fantastic in it. The other show that I got to finish uh, in February was It's a Sin, which is a British limited series from Russell T. Davies, which is about the outbreak of HIV and AIDS in the UK. Um, in the 80s. What I love about all of these British shows is that they know how to use shorter run times. I feel like so many American dramas, like especially ones on Netflix, tend to overstay their welcome and they for some reason force every drama to be like an hour long. It's a Sin is just five episodes long, it's 45 minutes per episode and that's perfect. It manages to capture all the essential moments covering an entire decade in the lives of uh, these, this group of friends living in the UK. But what's really interesting about It's a Sin that separates it from other shows and movies about HIV and AIDS is that it is very lively and it's very fun and energetic without disrespecting the subject matter because the show understands that the people who were at the center of this crisis were young people who really just wanted to live their lives and be free and the show pays respect to that part of them as well. There are lots of great performances in this, uh, but the ones that really stand out to me are number one, Keely Hawes, who is one of the best actors working out of the UK today, who only really gets stuff to do in the last episode, but when she, when she arrived, it like elevates the show to a whole nother level almost. And then there's Lydia West, who is much younger, but she stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Keely Hawes, and she very slowly emerges as the real protagonist of the show over the course of the series, and it's great to see her character build up, it's great to see her interact with every person differently. 
Um, yeah, just overall, it's a really great limited series that you can probably finish in one day. Moving on to film, the first thing I want to talk about is Saint Maud, which is a, a British horror movie about a hospice nurse named Maud who is taking care of a, of this older woman. But the thing with Maud is that she is extremely religious to a scary degree and she begins to become obsessed with this woman and saving her soul. It's fascinating how contemporary Saint Maud is. It's not like it, it saturates us in like social media or like very 21st century tropes or whatever, but it just feels like it's it's in the moment. It feels like something that's really taking place in the present. Um, I feel like a lot of horror movies, when they go for their you know, horror stuff or when they show us the creatures or the monsters, they tend to feel very gothic. This one feels very contemporary, it's the best way I can put it. And what's cool about Saint Maud is that there is no real villain. It's really just Maud and her almost addiction to God, um, or her idea of what of who God is. That does make it a psychological thriller, but it's not that kind of psychological thriller that makes you like second guess everything you're seeing, because Maud is very certain of her faith. It's just that the faith she has is so self-destructive and it's so bizarre. And Morfid Clark, who plays Maud, is incredible. She is, again, one of these women in a horror movie who is giving a performance that deserves as many nominations as any of these other people who are getting nominated. Um, her eyes are so dead throughout this movie, but what, what makes her performance so interesting is that she has voiceover narration where she's talking to God, um, and her conversations with God are so bitter and they're so angry, but they're so like in love as well with, with this higher power. It's a really fascinating vocal performance on top of the physical performance. Next is A Most Beautiful Thing, which is a documentary about the first African-American public high school rowing team in the United States. Um, and the documentary follows these men in, in their adulthood as they try to get back into rowing for the first time in a long time. The core group of men in this documentary is incredibly likable, and whenever the film focuses just on them and what they had to go through as children and how they've sort of grown up and, and sort of overcome their circumstances, the film can be incredibly inspiring and it's just great to watch them hang out. Unfortunately, by the, by the last third of the movie, it suddenly decides to turn into like pro-cop propaganda for some strange reason, which you know is wrong on so many different levels, but it's especially wrong here because we spent the first third of the movie talking about how a lot of the violence that was in these kids, in these people's childhood was you know, partially because of the presence of the police and the threat of police violence. And suddenly, by the last third of the movie, they're telling us that, you know, you can overcome all that conflict by just being friends with the cops and rowing with them. It's just, it's really strange, and I don't know why they decided to go there. Next is another documentary called 76 Days, which is about the first few days of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. Um, and the film takes place entirely in hospitals, in hotels where people are quarantining, and it really just sort of focuses on people trying to cope with this outbreak that, at the time, no one really understood yet. It is, of course, incredibly difficult to watch. Over a year into this pandemic, and these images still hurt every single time. But the film serves as a very good reminder for us to still take this seriously because there are lots of people who don't. And what's useful about this is that the health workers really tell the story themselves. There is no narrator here, there's no disembodied voice trying to tie everything together from a distance. It's purely observational and it just focuses on these people doing their jobs. There are so many people still today who don't want to listen to health workers and doctors and I think 76 Days reminds us that they are doing the most. And even if the film is just, you know, all observational, all the little drama that we can see from the ho from like these hospital hallways and, and the rooms, it's all really potent drama and you get to know all these different people, all these different patients, even if a lot of the health workers are just completely wrapped up in PPEs the entire time. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard to watch, but it's, it's essential, I think. Next up is Dear Comrades, which was the Russian entry to the Oscars for Best International Feature. Uh, for this year. This is about a woman in the 60s in Russia who is like hardcore communist, supports her political party, but after a massacre happens in 1962, she begins to challenge her own ideas of what she believes in. I personally didn't really get enough of the protagonist's point of view here. I really wanted more out of like her thought process of her sort of shifting towards a different, maybe if not ideology, and just like a way of of looking at things in our country. I was kind of hoping that this film would make a clear distinction between the ideology that the party was running on and whatever she like actually wanted in her heart. But still, I think it is a well-made movie. I think the director, Andrei Konchalovsky, 
knows how to film like crowd scenes in particular because it's been a while since I've seen like lots of people grouped together. The crowd scenes here were so striking. Um, and even in these huge crowds of people, Yulia Vysotskaya, the lead actress, really stands out. And while the movie doesn't necessarily give the character a whole lot of, it doesn't really articulate her thought process, I feel like you still get the essence of how she feels just from how she how she performs. Next is a documentary called Softy, which is also known in the UK, I believe, as The Underdog and The Battle for Kenya. Very different titles. This is about a political activist who starts a grassroots campaign in order to campaign for political office. This documentary obviously gets a whole lot of access to Boniface's grassroots campaign. We get to learn a lot about him and his family and the campaign manager and all these different people. The most important thing that the film teaches us or reminds us of uh, which is also the most important thing Boniface learns is the fact that without like significant political machinery, a grassroots campaign has very, very little chance of actually making an impact. The, th the thing that really gets in the way is that while he's trying to campaign to th these ordinary Kenyans, they tell him to his face that if they don't if he doesn't have money that he can give them, like right now, they're not going to support him, which I think is, something, this is a very bitter pill to swallow, but it's true. However, this is also the thing that I think is sorely lacking in Softy. I don't think it really paints ordinary voters in a very positive light, and I think that a movie like this has the responsibility to give more nuance to ordinary voters, because after every instance where these voters turn him away and say, like, you know, you don't have money, we're not gonna support you, it shows Boniface or the, or the campaign manager, like, muttering under their breath, saying, uh, these people aren't educated, etc., etc., but you know, that's not necessarily true. I think it's unfair to characterize them in that way, so yeah. Next is an Iranian film called There Is No Evil, which won the Golden Bear at Berlin in 2020. This is an anthology film made up of four different stories that are all somehow tied to the death penalty in Iran. Ultimately, I don't really think There Is No Evil says a whole lot, and I think its focus is on the wrong people. I don't really think this is a spoiler, but all of the main characters in the four vignettes are all people who pull the trigger, so to speak, and are guilty of executing people. Um, but it ne the film never really focuses on those who were killed. And at the end of the day, I feel like all the stories end up on the same conclusion, so to speak. However, there are great performances in, in each uh, vignette, and you know, as a character study of how these people feel so morally conflicted with what they have to do, I guess the film does work. However, I can't really be too angry with the film's choices because I just have a lot of admiration for the director, Mohammad Rasulov, who, because of this film and his previous films, was censored by the government. He was threatened with imprisonment. Even if I have personal issues with how the film t decides to tell its story, the fact that he's ruffled the government's feathers that much tells me that he's probably doing something really right. Next is a film called Two of Us, which is Frances' submission to the Oscars this year for Best International Feature. This is about two older women who are who have been in love with each other for the longest time, and they, in their you know older age, are finally deciding to make a life together, but something happens that sort of gets in the way of those plans. There are lots of little things in the storytelling here that I don't really agree with, because of how this movie sets up the world of the, of the film as being realistic and grounded in solid internal logic, I just feel like there are some things that the characters do that just don't feel very real, and I feel like certain characters who are acting suspicious are just way too suspicious, and I feel like the other characters should notice uh, much faster. But again, I can't really be mad just because this movie is so unique for a romance, because when's the last time you watched the romance that was just like directed completely like a psychological thriller, but nothing scary actually happens. Like, just for no reason at all, the director will linger on a moment or, like, look at a dark hallway or whatever, and nothing actually happens. It's just that that's the way the film is directed, and I have to give him kudos for just going for it. And Barbara Sokoa, who plays the lead character, the one, the one of the two that we focus on more, um, she is completely on board with the director's vision because she knows exactly how to play this character as both a romantic lead and as the lead in like a psychological thriller type of movie. Next up is Flora and Ulysses, which is a children's movie on Disney Plus that I decided to watch for some reason. It's about a little girl who befriends a squirrel that suddenly gains superpowers. Yeah. I will say this though, Matilda Lawler, who plays Flora in the movie, is genuinely really, really impressive. And I hope she gets a huge career ahead of her because she is giving her all in this movie. She knows exactly how to play to the camera. Her emotions are so sincere. Her performance is so overqualified for this entire movie. 
Uh, this is one of those movies that I don't think actually does anything to help the characters reach their sort of emotional climaxes. It just sort of puts them through a bunch of like unfunny comedic scenarios and then says, oh, this is how they feel now. Also, I just couldn't get over the fact that this movie is covered in Disney product placement. It keeps reminding us that Disney owns Star Wars now, they own Marvel. And for some reason, there's this side character who is a young boy who has like temporary blindness. They keep saying like it's temporary blindness, but they keep making fun of the fact that he's blind. Like, I don't know why, and I don't know why you would put that in a children's movie of all things. So it's, it's a very weird movie. But still, nothing can be worse than the new Tom and Jerry movie, which is about Tom and Jerry who start causing a ruckus at this hotel where a celebrity wedding is about to take place. I don't know why that's the plot that they went with. This movie physically nauseated me. I had a very hard time watching it just because my eyes did not agree with how the live action was blending with the animation. It just looked wrong to me and it was very hard for me to focus on. Maybe that's just me, but maybe it'll happen for other people as well. And the rest of this movie is just filled with all these embarrassing jokes that are not funny in the slightest, that feel like they were written by older people who were trying to pander to a young audience without understanding what young audiences find funny. It also just sends a really weird message about how you should probably settle for your bad relationship with your partner because just because the partner is rich or like is appears to be putting in some effort for the first time in god knows how long it's a i don't again i don't know why th this is the message in a tom and jerry movie it's it's weird don't watch it and then we have the spongebob movie sponge on the run which uh, is the latest cg animated spongebob movie after the one that came out I forgot when, like a few years ago, I actually did not watch. Because I didn't watch that last one, I don't know how similar this is. This being my first encounter with a new CG Spongebob movie, I, I just didn't like the humor. It's very, very far away from the original Spongebob humor, which is very surreal. Here, again, just like Tom and Jerry, it feels like it's pandering to an audience without understanding what that audience likes. Probably the biggest sin that this movie commits is that it forces its characters to act out of character. One of the main things that makes these characters so interesting when they're in like good material is the fact that few of them actually genuinely like each other but this movie forces them to be friends which comes off as completely false however with that said this movie is so fun to watch because the animation style is beautiful and again i i haven't seen the previous one so this is my first encounter with it but i love the animation style it's just this amazing blend of cg and traditional animation and stop motion animation the textures during close-ups look so tactile. I, I really, really loved it. But the main thing I wanted to talk about in this video without really getting too in-depth into it um, is Judas and the Black Messiah, directed by Shaka King, which is far and away the best thing I saw in February. I'm not really gonna go in-depth just because I'm gonna save my thoughts on this for the video, hopefully tomorrow or something, where I'm gonna rank uh, the Best Picture nominees. But very quick thoughts, I think that for a big studio biopic, it's very, very different from what we're used to seeing. I personally really loved how the characters were written, and I think the performances are incredible, and I think practically everything about it worked for me. But again, just like in the last video, I'm gonna use this movie as sort of a jumping off point to raise narrative questions for you, uh, especially for those who are maybe trying to write something themselves. These are just like open questions for you to consider. Um, feel free to disagree with me. I'm just like trying to start a discussion for whoever's still watching. Now when I watch a movie like Judas and the Black Messiah, I always have the same question, which is how much liberty does can one really take with a story that is based on a true story? My first response to that question would be to say that I personally, and I think a lot of people I know, and a lot of people who watch movies in general, we have an expectation of movies that are based on a true story. We know that they're not going to be 100% historically accurate, and for most of us, that's actually okay. Like, we don't come to movies for these things. If we want, like, hard scientific fact, we do our own research, or we look at sources that are not within the entertainment industry. However, with that said, there are, of course, many, many movies that we can cite that are historically inaccurate and it's because they're historically inaccurate that they become less effective for us or that they feel inauthentic. My favorite example, which is always the first thing that comes into my head, is Bohemian Rhapsody, which is a movie that I don't really like, that while I was watching it, I already felt like I don't understand what they're trying to say about Freddie Mercury. And then when I did further research, I discovered that there's so much about that movie that is historically inaccurate to the point that you know, it's not just historically inaccurate just to fit 
certain plot points into the running time, but it's inventing conflict that was never there in the first place, and it just makes the whole movie feel like a fabrication. So I guess the question that emerges then is how do you get a character based on a real person right? Or how do you get an event based on a real event? Right. I think most people would say something like you have to get at least the core of the character or the event correct, which is good in theory, but then you have to ask the other question, which is who is to decide what the real core of a character is, especially for controversial historical figures who have very different sides to them. Depending on, the, on who you ask, the core of a character might be completely different. And I think other people would argue that there is no one core to a real human being. You know, they are so, you know, people in general are just very contradictory and aren't really supposed to make sense. I mean, that's why people invent characters. That's why we have fiction. Again, it's an impossible question to answer, but let's assume first that there is a core that we can put into a character that we can write. I think a lot of people would argue that as long as you capture what that character believes, and the main things that they accomplished in their lives without ignoring the things that they got wrong. That's generally sort of a good recipe, I suppose, for a character based on a real person. Again, we can also cite a lot of movies that we consider good examples of movies based on true stories. Uh, for me, Judas and the Black Messiah is a fantastic example of that. I personally bought the characterizations of Fred Hampton and William O'Neill, but at the same time, I also understand that I'm not supposed to take this movie as, like, scripture. I'm supposed to supplement the viewing of this movie with my own research, and I think that's true for every film based on a true story. But okay, let's say you have that character down now, you have that event down. The thing is, though, when you put that film or when you put that onto a screenplay, it still might come off as inauthentic or fabricated when you put it on film just because of the nature of film itself. Obviously, it's impossible to condense someone's life story into two hours, but let's say that even if you stick to the facts of just certain events in someone's life and you put them on film, still the movement from one scene to the next or from one time period to the next might appear too quick that it'll make the events seem like they're, they've been packed too closely together. So, you know, there's a distortion of time that happens with cinema that, you know, inadvertently can make a real story come off as false. So that's just like something that I think people have to consider when writing for the screen like this. Again, I don't really have any real answers or solutions to this. I just wanted to bring up the discussion. But I think that the best sort of guideline or guiding principle that people can, can take with them is that beyond just trying to get a character right, beyond getting an event right, I think the best kinds of movies that are based on true stories are those that really have a reason for existing in the present. I think that the best biopics aren't those that just sort of report on somebody's life. I think that the best ones are ones that are aware of what these people's legacy is or how their actions have rippled to the present. And I don't necessarily mean that these movies have to explicitly connect to you know current events, but there has to be an awareness of the present as well when you talk about the past or an awareness of the future, rather. But yeah, that's that's sort of what I think about it. But again, I'm just sort of raising the discussion, um, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. All right, so those are my thoughts on everything that I saw in February. Again, please look out for the Oscars video that is hopefully gonna come out before the Oscars. But yeah, thank you again, guys, for still being here and for watching. I hope you continue to stay safe and stay healthy, especially now. Please, please, please take this situation seriously and support a local, like community initiatives to help out. All right, so if you have any thoughts on anything I talked about in this video, please do leave me a comment and let's have a conversation.